on this episode of The Natural Plastic Surgeon. And so yeah. the news came to me and it was very shocking. And I didn't really know how to respond or react. And what DCIS is, it means it's just they've basically found cancer that hasn't spread right. outside of the milk ducts, essentially, was where yeah. they were the cancer. It's called duct ductal carcinoma mm -hmm. in situ. In situ means like in its own home, right? Yes. So it hasn't really broken outside the home mm -hmm. and like caused problems it's elsewhere. All entailed. Yeah. It's pretty scary it's a very long needle when i say yeah. long oh my gosh like this long and how could it be that long you're not even that's not even like your whole chest is like half that size screw cancer it sucks <laughs> um, i have a tattoo on my wrist that i got before surgery that says i trust life mm. and i do Hey folks, this is the Natural Plastic Surgeon Podcast, and we have a special guest on the show. Another, everyone's special, but this one is extremely special because she is uh, our Director of Operations, Alessandra. She's joining us today for this podcast um, on her focus for breast cancer awareness for this month of October. And I, I want to kind of dive into Alessandra. She is our Director of Operations, and how long have you been working for us? Almost three months. Almost three months. And you guys, we've come light years uh, from where we started without her, and we've um, we've done amazing things for our patients, and we've really kind of uh, streamlined a lot of our processes ever since she joined us. Now, Alessandra's from Boston, um, Boston. Boston. Yeah, but you don't have an accent. Where? You don't. Okay. What is that? Purposeful or is it the? I'm where from you, outside of Boston, yeah, okay. so Newton, Massachusetts. So Newton, Massachusetts. Newton, they Massachusetts. they don't have a Boston <laughs> accent. It's no. just. Newton, it's, it's perfect English. Um, okay, so you uh, attended college at USC. I did. And you've been in operations for a while now. You've mm -hmm. actually worked at um, uh, Beverly Hills Rejuvenation Center. You've worked at um, Equinox, at, at some of these really high-end luxury places. Um, 13 years of operation mm -hmm. management experience. Well-known lux luxury brand, lifestyle brands, and beauty, fitness, and wellness industries. Um, you've been in LA for 18 years now? 18 wow. years. Wow. I didn't realize that. <laughs> and you're an avid Boston sports fan. So what are some teams that you like? The Patriots. Okay. So football. And Red Sox. Okay. All right. So I'm a huge Pats fan too. So <laughs> that's how you got the job is you're a Pats fan. Go Pats. Actually, Go Pats. I have a lot of followers out in um, Boston. And they send me Patriots gear. They actually one of one of our patients who came and flew out here from Boston. She gave Audrey a little Patriots outfit, oh. and when we watched them win the Super Bowl, she um, she got to wear that. And I put so that on social cute. media. Yeah. Um, and um, you you live a very health, healthy lifestyle. You do yoga daily. Mm -hmm. um, you are uh, all about the latest restaurants, hanging out in Malibu, enjoying life. Yes. And and you're working here, and you're doing great. Um, so I, I want to kind of dive into um, how you ended up coming out and and working in and management and operations and and what's kind of your your brief story about your career sure yeah I have always been a leader I would say I played sports was always captain of my team so leadership came naturally to me mm -hmm. um, I worked for the sports club LA while I was in college really I did I didn't know that <laughs> yes so sports club LA uh, was bought by Equinox yeah so <clears throat> got it so I started there at the front desk moved into the spa and took initiative you know in my role I was just working front desk but created training manuals and you know naturally kind of took on the leadership role yeah. that always kind of seemed to find me and just realized that I had a knack for operations for management for development of training materials for staff recruiting staff, training staff. And I just realized it was, you know, something that was niche and interesting to me. Yeah. And so I've been able to craft and build a really wonderful and successful career in operations management. It's something I'm really passionate about. And yeah, yeah it's all the details that matter. You and are very detail oriented, <laughs> yeah. I will say. I, what, now tell me more about what really does light your fire when you get really excited about stuff? What, what, I'm passionate about culture. 
Okay. You know, I love staff and I want everyone, you spend more time at work than right. you spend at home, even yeah. with family members. So, you know, hiring the right staff, but giving them also the, the tools that they need to be successful at their job, the training materials, the ongoing training and education mm -hmm. so that they can feel like they're developing personally and professionally. You know, it's, it's a reason to come to work every day to love the people you work for and with. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, I think creating streamlined processes and operations so that, you know, everything feels organized and you know where things are when you need them. And so it just it creates like a, a much better environment, I think, for everybody when right. they're at work. I think that especially hones in true for the patient experience. Absolutely. You know, if your, um, your nurse or, uh, your doctor is, um, you know, is not meshing well, there's not a good team environment, mm -hmm. it affects your care. So it's yeah. not, I know the sports club of LA is mm -hmm. a gym and that's very important to have a team approach there. There's a lot mm -hmm. of important things that happen there, but when it comes to healthcare and people's yeah. surgeries and people's results and their, um, we're talking emotional levels like times 10. You mm -hmm. know, and, and to, and, and so to really kind of, I think it, it comes down to a really strong team and I'm glad that that's your focus because mm -hmm. I think it's kind of taken bare plastic surgery to, and Ivy surgical center to the next level in terms of the care that we provide. That's ultimately Absolutely. our end goal is providing, mm -hmm. you know, really high, highly efficient, great results, streamlined care mm -hmm. to all of our patients. Oh, and we can do that for staff then it's easier for them to right. do their jobs and be there for our patients. Exactly. So, um, so the reason why we have you on the show is actually you were a patient yes. at, at, at a recent point, uh, not yes. too long ago and still are. Mm -hmm. Um, and th we're talking about breast cancer, uh, breast cancer awareness in October and it can mm -hmm. happen to anybody. It happened to you. It did. So, it did. um, Tell us about this. You were you were you at the sports club of LA at the time, or were you at uh, Beverly Hills I was Rejuvenation Center? I at Center? Beverly Hills Rejuvenation yeah. Center. Mm -hmm. um, I so I was diagnosed with intermediate stage zero um, breast cancer. DCIS. DCIS. Yeah. Exactly in my right breast, mm -hmm. and that happened back in November. So let's 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 back up. So one morning you woke up. It's not like you got an email like, "Hey, you have breast cancer." <laughs> no. uh, I, I, and no. I'm not trying to make light of this, but yeah. uh, tell me about the because um, you're young, right? I tell am. me about this process. Like, what? How did you find it? Was this, was something you noticed or what? Okay, so my mom actually was diagnosed with the same thing about okay. I would say 16 years ago okay and so we also have a unfortunate like history of cancer in the family yeah um, from pancreatic to lung to breast so with kind of that history in my family it was recommended and my mom um, also did the genetic testing but yeah. it's also recommended by my OBGYN to follow through and do the genetic testing mm -hmm. um, and so I did the genetic testing and I found out that I was BRCA2 positive okay which so my mom was also which is why we thought that you know there was a high likelihood that I would be also so mom had breast cancer before she was 50 years old she had it uh, in the beginning of 50s. Okay, so yeah. premenopausal. Yes. Okay, so premenopausal -menop pre breast cancer is mm -hmm. a, is an indication to get genetically tested yes. alone. And then a family member who's had premenopausal breast cancer um, is a good reason for you to get tested. Absolutely. Okay, so she tested BRCA positive, BRCA2 positive, positive, which means there's a good chance that you might have that. Correct. So then you got tested. And I tested positive. Wait, so now when she got breast cancer, um, did I was they in test college. You? So you're just like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, uh, when did you decide to actually get tested? So the recommendation <clears throat> from my mom's doctor, I think what she understood was yeah. typically if her onset was like in her early 50s, yeah. would be for anyone closely related to start doing their mammograms about 10 years prior to her onset of mm -hmm. breast cancer. So the thought was I would start doing mammograms at 40. Okay. Um, and, you know, but I think my mom wanted me to be really proactive. And given the cancer history in our family, it was really my OBGYN as well, who was very kind of encouraging um, of getting the genetic testing. 
Okay, so mom got genetic testing. Mom got genetic testing. Yeah. And then how long after that did you get genetic testing? Years after. Oh, yeah. So, so she was mom, BRCA2 mm -hmm. and you weren't worried at all? Not at the time. I was, okay. so, I was so young. Okay. And I was in, you know, I came out to school around 17, 18 okay. <clears throat> when my mom was diagnosed. Wow. So I mean, that, that's, that's I, difficult in and of itself. It was. Age. And yeah. I was out here in California and she was back home in Boston. Right. So it was very challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so something randomly, you're just like, Hey, I'm just, my OBGYN said I should get tested. I'm going to go get mm -hmm. tested. So I went and okay. did it. Yeah. And then the results came back. And to be honest, uh, again, I was probably, I think 33 at the time. Yeah. So, uh, um, I didn't do anything immediately. The next steps so, were to get an MRI. Yeah. So let's back up. So B R yeah. C A. I have to pull up the stats on this because I always okay. forget. Um, basically, like anywhere from fifty to seventy four percent, seventy five percent likely to get um, breast cancer. Yes. And ovarian cancer too, or and no? Ovarian cancer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's kind of a, that's kind of a bad hand to be dealt. Like okay. you're playing cards and <laughs> like, I've got like, that, that's, that's not a great hand. Yeah. And it was shocking. I don't think I knew what to do with that information at the time. Mm -hmm. And the next steps being to get an MRI and, okay. but you have to align that with your menstrual cycle. <laughs> so okay. I think at the time I kind of put it off. And to be honest, I feel like it probably wasn't till about six to eight months later again with my OBGYN. Mm -hmm. Um, and she just, you know, said, you really need to follow through on this. And I said, okay. And, uh, made an appointment to, to do the MRI and so this was about six to eight months after finding out that I was BRCA2 positive and um, then did my MRI. And now, did they rec she recommended an MRI or did you already have a mammogram and didn't show anything? I hadn't had a mammogram. Okay. So actually what they recommended, and I was being seen at Cedars. Mm -hmm. And so their recommendation for somebody who was BRCA to positive was to do every six months you would come in for testing so you would do an MRI and then six months later you come in and do a mammogram and ultrasound so you would and and I do the same testing for ovarian cancer going in to see my OBGYN as wow. well to do ultrasound every six months okay mm -hmm. so, so very preventative yeah uh, <laughs> so you have to get an ultrasound every six months Yes. Okay, for ovarian. Mm -hmm. Now, you had the MRI done for the breast. Mm -hmm. And what happened? So results came back that they they do the MRI with an in, like a dye injection mm -hmm. and so it showed my right breast like had several like places that were lit up essentially. And the left but the left breast was fine. Left breast was fine. Interesting. Yes. Okay. And so then I was asked to come in and do a mammogram and an ultrasound. Okay. Uh, and I went to those appointments alone. Like I didn't oh, think, gosh. you know, it's one of those things. I think I didn't think that it was, I was so young and yeah. I just thought like, okay, because they can find just H like. How old were you at the, at this time? So this is 30, 34. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I went to the appointment alone and like, lo and behold, I'm sitting after the mammogram and then they want to confirm findings. And so I have to go back in for the ultrasound. And Gosh. I remember calling my parents and just saying that like something's wrong. Yeah. Like they're, you know, this, this process is taking longer than expected. And, and sure enough, they called me in to just let me know that, um, they needed to do a biopsy. So I did the biopsy the next day. Okay. Still by yourself? By myself. I went to the biopsy though with my parents. Okay. So they flew out? They actually have moved out here oh. at this point. So they actually oh, okay. moved out to California two years ago. Okay. So they're close by. I'm Great. in the valley and they live in I'm Woodland just, Hills. Well, good. The winters are nicer <laughs> in Woodland Hills versus Boston. Right. Yeah. Much nicer. Newton. Retirement suits them well. <laughs> yeah. Good for them. Yes. So they're close by and I have to say I'm very thankful throughout the whole experience mm -hmm. um, that they were by my side. So. Okay. So 
Have you ever had a biopsy before? No. Okay. I've never had a biopsy. So t- tell us about that. What was that like? It was weird. I'll be yeah. honest. I actually had a male doctor who did okay. it. So this was kind of my first experience too. Like once I think you kind of get into the breast cancer realm, you start feeling a little bit more open because I was definitely a little bit more private. Right. And, and so all of a sudden you've got lots of people looking at your boobs and touching your boobs. Yeah. You know about this. Sort of. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you know way. also how patients I, yeah. I know i can really empathize with how patients feel yeah. because it, it's very nerve-wracking and so yeah i, I just didn't know what to expect mm-hmm. with this um and what really was all entailed it's pretty scary it's a very long needle when i yeah. say long oh my gosh like this long and how could it be that long you're not even that's not even like your whole chest is like half that size how why was really it that long crazy because they kind of they almost do like a mammogram and they like squish squish your breast yeah and essentially they know where they the area that they need to target and so then it's like this big long needle that gets injected and it sounds like a gun okay Um, that part's the scary part yeah did it Um, hurt they numb it so i didn't really feel it okay yeah but you do get a little tiny scar from where yeah, they the go biopsy. in. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just remember just being a little traumatized. Like after it, there was like blood trickling down and I was just like, what's happening? <laughs> it, it was just very I, right. yeah. like... Because there was there was there like a YouTube video about breast biopsy that you get to watch beforehand no, or anything? No, to be honest, I think I didn't really seek out a lot of information. Okay. I was just kind of going with it. I think yeah. I was in so like shock yeah. that I was just kind of showing up and going through the motions. Mm-hmm. And I think I like knowing less almost probably made me feel better. Okay. Yeah. We, I mean, we get, we get, we get patients like that sometimes too, that, yeah. that we get the ones that want to see every single video <laughs> and every single detail of surgery that I put out there. And then we get the ones that are like, I don't want to watch that. I don't yeah. want to psych myself out. Exactly. Yeah. So biopsy was done. Biopsy was done. And that happened on a Friday. Okay. And which is the worst time because you know they're not going to have results. Exactly. So I was told that they would have results the next week. Yeah. So it was great weekend that was. Definitely (laughs) a very tough weekend. Just kind of waiting for the news. And I actually got the news while I was at work. Oh. So my doctor called me on my cell phone mm. and I didn't really know how to react. At that point, you know, I'd actually talked to the doctor who had done the biopsy mm-hmm. and he was feeling very optimistic in terms of just looking at like kind of the x-ray that they do or in terms of looking at the ultrasound or whatever kind of imaging he was looking at. He I felt like had kind of maybe reassured me that everything maybe didn't look so abnormal or looked fine. So at the time I was thinking more positively and was, you know, I, I, even though I was anxious, I was hoping for the best and just really hoping that everything was going to be fine. So the news came to me and it was very shocking and I didn't really know how to respond or react. And I can imagine being a doctor on the other end, that that's a very hard call to have to make. Yeah. And I mean, it's that like, I I, young and uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've relayed bad news to people before. Yeah. Um, you always try to do it in person. Uh, I, I, that's why I didn't want to be my first when I, when I became a doctor, I thought I want to be a cancer doctor because my dad yeah. had cancer. And I was yeah. like, I can't, I can't give the people news like this all the time. I can't yeah. do that. Um, you try to do it in person, but sometimes you just, you don't want to like say, Hey, you have to come in and like, we have to talk about it in this person. Cause then you know, it's bad. Right. You just deal with it over the phone. Yeah. And so you're at work though. So like, what, do you, work, what do you do? I was shocked. I yeah. think little tears rolled down my face and she just said, you know, can, can you come in to the office mm. and you know, do you want to bring your parents with you? And I said, yes. So it was an immediate call to my parents Yeah. and I was in her office within an hour and a half or mm. so. And she was wonderful. She sat us all down, explained, you know, what they had found mm-hmm. and what my options were. And then we made the decision to move forward. So 
you're in a unique situation. You're a young mm-hmm. woman, mm-hmm. but you have a genetic predisposition that really increases your risk of breast cancer. And, yes. and, and sure enough, you already had DCIS, intermediate. This is probably going to, you know, it's it's not full-blown cancer, but it's probably about to right. go there. Mm-hmm. So what do they, it's probably what in a nutshell, what they mentioned to you or what? Yeah, she okay. explained what that actually yeah. meant. So at what DCIS is, it means it's just, They've basically found cancer that hasn't spread right. outside of the milk ducts, essentially, was where yeah. they were the cancer. It's called really- duct- ductal carcinoma mm-hmm. in situ. In situ means like in its own home, right? Yes. So it hasn't really broken outside the home mm-hmm. and like caused problems elsewhere. Yes. So um, that's great to catch it at that stage, though. So. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's great. It's beyond lucky. Yeah. And so I'm just, you know, I was grateful I think that's the place that I tried to come from was Mm -hmm. just to say I'm just so happy that I was proactive and that we caught this as early as we did yeah and so the options were to do a lumpectomy which would just be to remove that breast tissue from the right breast Mm -hmm. and then I would have to do radiation Mm -hmm. and then also take the tamoxifen which would have put me into early menopause Mm. or the other option was to do the double mastectomy okay and that was highly recommended you wouldn't need you wouldn't need radiation at that point at that ideally with the double mastectomy then you know you're removing all of the breast tissue so i mean she would be testing my lymph nodes and the hope was once they removed the breast tissue that it hadn't spread. Spread. Got it. So as long as it hadn't spread, then I wouldn't have to do any radiation. Got it. Um, (laughs) What a difficult choice to make. Mm -hmm. What a difficult choice. I am going to either remove both my breasts Mm -hmm. uh, or I'm going to kind of disfigure one give it some radiation, totally not going to be like the other one, and then take a medication that's going to really mess my hormones up. Yeah. And I don't have kids at this stage of the right. game, so yeah. taking that off the table felt, okay. you know, yeah. that felt big. But I had a lot of questions too because having a double mastectomy, you can't breastfeed or, you know, so right. there's, there's yeah. all that. But I almost didn't know like what questions to ask. Like you have – like this all happened in a matter of like Thursday to Tuesday. Right. And before I found all this, out all this information. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was like so overwhelming. Right. But I have to say having my mom there and the fact that she had been through it, uh-huh. she was a great support because I think you're in such shock and in almost just like such disbelief that it's hard to remember questions that you want to ask or yeah. even know what to ask because it's just life-changing information that's yeah. coming at you and so she was well prepared to ask questions and take notes just so we could talk about it afterwards she had had the same thing and she had chosen to do the right. lumpectomy yeah and you know she's taken the tamoxifen she did radiation yeah uh, and luckily she's been in remission mm-hmm. all these years but because she didn't remove the breast tissue she goes in every six months for the mammogram and has to still see her doctor right and And she still may need a mastectomy and yeah at some point you know given with BRCA2 as well you're the likelihood of actually developing cancer even if you were to have a lumpectomy and the radiation Mm -hmm. and take the tamoxifen is still very high yeah so that's why my doctor really re- recommended to do the double mastectomy. Yeah, and there, and there's other mm-hmm. things to consider too in terms of breast reconstruction. Yeah. Uh, we as plastic surgeons, when we do mm-hmm. breast reconstruction, we hate radiation. So yeah. it's like we would almost rather do uh, have a prophylactic mastectomy because then at least the skin is kind of of normal quality, yes. and you can do a reconstructive reconstruction that is much more. Um, beautiful, I guess, uh, or more characteristic of a natural breast versus dealing with a radiated lumpectomy breast. It's not, that's really challenging to work with. And that did come up as well because they said if you did go that route, if it did come back, then the surgery becomes much more challenging and often you have to do skin grafting because the skin is essentially dead from radiation at that point. So 
all of those things considered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen, you know? I've seen, and I've done some um, prophylactic mastectomies, uh, and I've done some bilateral immediate reconstructions, and and honestly, some of them look like real breasts. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable, like what mm-hmm. can be done. So. It's amazing. But some are more challenging than others. And, and yeah. it's just radiation is our biggest enemy. But yeah. so, all right. So the month before all this happened, <laughs> what was like your biggest thing in life? Like, were you worried about your variance reports from your injectable <laughs> sales? Were you worried about like your dog going to the vet or or, or what What was like the biggest thing in your mind? Until it was a this? busy time actually okay. at, where I was working. We were yeah. opening a new location in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh-huh. I was traveling quite a bit. We had two locations in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. So just, you know, I really kind of sunk myself into work. And the week before surgery, I was actually in Boca Raton setting up our new location. So, you know, I think twofold, it's um, you know, I took a couple days off yeah. prior to my surgery. So I had a surgery on a Monday and I oh, took, so you just kept rolling right through. I work. kept rolling right wow. through. Okay. I took Thursday and Friday off and yeah. then had Saturday, Sunday, and I went to my happy place at the beach in Malibu cool. and just took some time for me and, um, just to get my head in the right place and yeah, just make sure that it, <laughs> you know, I was feeling my best, um, you know, emotionally going into it on Monday. Surgery on Monday. Surgery on so Monday. So it yeah. happened all that fast. It happened very quickly. Okay. So I found out, I found out in November before Thanksgiving mm-hmm. and then my surgery was scheduled on December 17th. So scheduled wow. right before Christmas. Wow. Which was tough, but yeah. we figured it, it need the, you know, the, by the recommendation of the doctor and, and the plastic surgeon needed to be done before the end of the year. It was yeah. important that we moved quickly mm-hmm. and, you know, we figured it was a good time, you know, I'd have family in town and we'd all be together. Yeah. So it made sense, you know, so get it done before Christmas. Let's talk about that. Like mm-hmm. what, uh, like a woman that has to like is, is, uh, in the same crossroads mm-hmm. where she's. Life has just turned upside down. Mm-hmm. She's just been diagnosed with breast cancer, yeah. whether she's BRCA2 or whatever, but she's given a bunch of treatment options in her and she's gone from focus on whatever she's focused on to now she's dealing with breast cancer. What's your, what, what's some of your recommendations or what are your thoughts to, for this person that, or some recommendations that might be helpful for her to, to kind of navigate this? Or, or what are some tips? I yeah. mean, I, I don't, you know, what do you recommend for this person to do? I would say, you know, what I've learned in life is to lean in (laughs) to what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a tattoo on my wrist that I got before surgery that says, I trust life. Mm. And I do. And I just feel like whatever is meant to be part of your story is meant to be part of your story. And so, you know, at this point, there was nothing I could do to change what was happening. And I felt like fighting it or feeling sorry for myself was almost a waste of energy. And so I was just looking to get myself into the best possible Mm headspace so that, you know, just wishing for the best possible outcome. And I tried to find gratitude in the situation that you know look I'm gonna I'm doing this I'm gonna save my life right I was proactive and we found this before I would have to do chemo or you know any any of the above right so I just you know kept you know, I, I guess <laughs> finding the gratitude and, and counting my blessings and just knowing that, you know, on the other side of this, hopefully, you know, I, you know, and I'm here today and well, healthy and happy and hope that I can, you know, encourage other people to be proactive. Could you, do you recommend someone to do this alone? No. Okay. So (laughs) absolutely not. I think finding a support system. mm -hmm. um, I did work with a therapist. Okay. um, By recommendation of my doctors, Mm -hmm. who was extremely helpful, and you know, there's definitely a lot of support groups as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's. It is a really kind of amazing thing. There's so much support out there, and I even talked to people who. Where? What's a support group that? You can 
mentioned? We Spark. I know we Spark? of. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of in the valley. Okay. Um, I know that there was just other groups that my therapist had recommended that I could attend if I felt like I needed to. Yeah. Um, and it they break it up also by your stages of cancer. They break it up just by your age. So there's a lot of different options out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for me, I think I wanted to just be around close family and friends. Mm-hmm. So everyone's different in terms of what they need and what they want. And I also didn't know necessarily what I needed. And so I think, you know, I worked right up until the end. And yeah. then it was more in the aftermath of surgery, I think, was where things got really emotional for T- me. Tell me about that. So you had surgery and mm-hmm. then and then what? So I was home for six weeks wow. after surgery. And that's a long time to take off of work, yeah. <laughs> which was also well, hard a, for me. Cause it's a big surgery. It's a huge surgery. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I really, I've had three back surgeries. I've had my appendix out. I've had wrist surgery. I've had a lot of sports injuries. Yeah. So, you know, what I. What sports did you play again? Soccer, ice hockey, tennis. Wow. <laughs> I was a gymnast, a dancer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'd been through a lot early on. I had my first back surgery at 16. Jesus. I know. It's pretty <laughs> crazy. So I'd been through a lot and, um, you know, I thought that okay I can do this and I wasn't necessarily like attached to my breasts I'd never thought about doing plastic surgery it was just such a whirlwind I was so busy with work prior to surgery that I don't think I thought about it Mm -hmm. all that much and then it was the morning of or the night before where the nerves kind of really set in but I didn't do again I wasn't looking at a lot of videos or kind of doing a lot of research so I went in kind of blind <laughs> to well, this, yeah. which I think was better for me personally. Yeah. Um, and then the aftermath of it though was more shocking to me just because I, the, it's very emotional it's, right. and that was the part that I don't think anyone can prepare you yeah. for. And I think it's probably different for everyone, but it comes in waves and being at home and I was lucky I was able to stay with my parents and they were yeah. able to care for me for that time. But being away from work, being away from friends, I had visitors, but just recovery in general is isolating and you kind of get a little depressed and you know physically you're going through so much and you had so much removed that it also like changes hormonally and you're on a lot of medication and so just all of it combined (laughs) that's the part that I feel like really was was tough yeah do you think um in your position now, um, when you get a chance to interact with patients, do you do you feel do you get a new appreciation for you know surgery and for what patients go oh, through? Absolutely, I think it's the having gone through something that I've gone through and being able to empathize with patients yeah. and you know when people wake up from surgery and knowing how they feel um, we have a lot of patients who are really scared before surgery right. you know and so being able to just talk them through and say I know it like what that feels like I think that it's helpful yeah, to have somebody say, it's funny because I think a lot of surgeons have like never had surgery no, or I, a lot I think of nurses right. have yeah. never and had surgery so to have Someone, We're so far removed. Yeah. 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 Who's been through it, mm-hmm. who can really kind of talk to you and empathize and know what you're going through and yeah. can give you tips and recommendations. And, you know, it's, um, it comes from that genuine place. Yeah. No, we don't, we don't do big mm-hmm. double mastectomy surgeries mm-hmm. and immediate reconstruction. Those are big yeah. hospital surgeries. And, but you know, some of the bigger surgeries you do like tummy tuck, mommy makeovers yeah. can get up there, you know, in terms uh-huh. of recovery. And, um, when that patient walks in that first week, I mean, they're going through so, so much. much. And I, and I, um, we have staff members that are not really, they don't really fully understand that. Mm-hmm. I was like, look, they're going to be, they're going to be short. They're going to be pissed off about something mm-hmm. um they're gonna take longer to get here they're gonna be late because it took them longer to get in and out of the car you know be okay with that yeah. understand that and and be there for them now yeah. if they're doing that in their three-month follow-up <laughs> and, you know kind of being a jerk okay it's a little different story but first week you know they're yeah. going through a lot and it's um i do these surgeries every week and it's like um you know it's each one of these patients first 
time mm-hmm. doing it. And so I just think it's great that you you were able to kind of experience that. Yeah. Um, uh, I understand it's a very difficult situation, but it, it's great that you can kind of you you, you kind of use that as your motivation now. And that's and you mentioned that's partly why you you wanted yeah. to work here. It's a way to pay it forward, and yeah, you know, I think be there for other women. And I think knowing, you know, what someone feels on the inside and, you know, I've sat in on consultations and, you know, yeah. there are just women who really feel strongly that they do want to get their breasts done. But at the same time, it doesn't kind of align with who they are spiritually or, you know, they didn't ever think that you know, they would get, you know, big boobs, <laughs> you know, yeah. and um, that d- doesn't feel like it fits like who they are. And so you see the internal struggle that they're right. going through. And so just being able to talk them through like my own story or, you know, uh, and, yeah. and how I feel afterwards. It's just I think it, it helps people to feel like they can open up and be honest and talk mm-hmm. about those you know, real feelings and yeah, thoughts. It, it doesn't get any, I mean, and <laughs> your situation is, is, it was much more dire. You really didn't have it. You were given a choice between two different surgical mm-hmm. choices, basically. And, um, you, you didn't have the luxury of not having to do something. Right. And so different, different ball game, but, um, you know, still, I think, I mean, it's just this incredible, valuable experience. Yeah. Um, you survived. I survived. They got all the breast cancer out. Yes. Right? And guess what? You didn't have to do chemo. I did. And you didn't have to do radiation. I didn't. So that's huge. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's mm-hmm. like a win. It right? was a huge win. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of things to be to be grateful for. Now, very grateful. at the end of this, are you happy? Everything? I'm tell very us. happy. Yeah. I'm very happy. I was very lucky. I had an actually an all woman surgical team. Great. Both surgeons were women. I even had women anesthesiologists. Wow. So I've been through two surgeries at this yeah. point. So um, the first one was the mastectomy, and uh, I had expanders put in. Okay. And then the second surgery was to remove the expanders, mm-hmm. put the implants in. And, and it also included uh, lipo with fat transfer. Bonus. Yeah, bonus. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's cool. We have nice. We have lots of yeah. little tricks to do breast reconstruction and um, yeah. taking fat from somewhere we don't want it. Yeah. Hey, you know, let's, let's, <laughs> we can use it for the breast. Definite you know? bonus. Yeah. So all in all, I mean, I had I had an amazing surgeon, mm-hmm. and I think she did an incredible job. I'm really happy with the results and. You know, she, it, they feel and look very natural and she's really proud of them as well. And she Good. feels like it looks like a breast dog Awesome. versus a reconstruction. I got very lucky. That's great. I got really lucky. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's just, it's funny. It's like, I've, I've seen, you know, some breast reconstructions that look better than some people's natural mm-hmm. breasts. And yeah. it's like, wow. You know, <laughs> we're getting pretty good. It's, like, it's you know. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, really it, it all worked is. out well. Um, you know, what do you tell the woman who's just been diagnosed with um, breast cancer? You know, if you were, if you could go back and like, were there any thing that you wish you did or wish you didn't do? Not wish I did or didn't do. I'd just say, you know, really love yourself through the process Mm -hmm. and give yourself time to heal. Surround yourself with positivity (laughs) and people who love you. You will need the support. It's Mm -hmm. definitely an emotional roller coaster. I'm not even a year out. This is, you know, the first October where we have breast cancer awareness a month and I've been emotional here at work and, you know, just in, it's, it's the first time this has really been part of my story when right. we're in breast cancer it, awareness month. So it's a journey and it's, you know, allow yourself the time to heal and feel all of those feelings and reach out for support when you need it. And, um, personal things that you, you did to kind of help your mind. Do you, did you do meditation? Did you do yoga? What, what did you do? I'm what? big on meditation and yoga. Okay. Walks on the beach okay. for me, lots of sunshine, Yeah, doing things that I know make me happy and mm-hmm. feed my soul. Yeah. 
just being kind and really loving to myself. And also I think just, you know, like positive affirmations and you know, your body is going through so much yeah. and you, it's, it's emotional. It's yeah. really emotional. And that was the part that I was really unprepared for in comparison to all the other I had big back surgeries and things like that. And yeah. it, it wasn't the emotional roller coaster right. that this, really was and this was truly life-changing yeah you know so but I've chosen to embrace it and share my story and encourage you know others to be proactive and yeah. get your mammogram right and uh, don't ignore that lump that just came out of nowhere ignore. yeah so we, we actually had Dr. Gremley on episode mm-hmm. 16 where she um and right here in LA she's she opens up she um she helped open up a like a urgent care for mm-hmm. breast lumps. So if you feel yeah. a breast lump in your breast, you could just pop over to um, the uh, Margie Peterson Breast Cancer Urgent Care and they check your lump. They could Fantastic. do imaging right away and you get the results right mm-hmm. away. So this is no like waiting for like several days. You're going to see different doctors. There's a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach. And I know Cedars has uh, a really good team over there, but yeah. I don't think they have this urgent care that they, they no, have at St. John's. So that's like, that, that's like a huge thing because... I think um, from hearing your story, um, from getting to work with breast cancer uh, reconstructive patients, um, especially earlier on in my career when I was doing a lot more of Mm it, um, the mental game is such a huge component and the emotional, Mm -hmm. the uh, the emotional thing. And it's like having a good team, good communication, um, learning more about it, educating yourself, all that stuff is, is really important. It is. And I think for some people, yeah, everyone's different in terms Mm. of what they need, but in terms of people who are supporting loved ones or family members who have cancer, I think just asking, you know, what they need, what they want, being there physically for people and just showing your love and support is the best thing you can possibly (laughs) do. It is. It's such a dramatic experience and it's hard to know what you need, but just lots of love, lots of love and the support. It's, is what, what something, what a person is going through one particular day is not Mm going to be the same thing the next day. You know, people are going to have bad days Mm -hmm. when they're recovering from stuff like this. And it's like, you just have to be there for people, you you know? So, um, I think that's so incredible. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah. So I noticed, <laughs> I know that you came to work here because you wanted to have a little more purpose. And that really, yeah. that really meant a lot to me because, uh, I can think of better ways to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not here to make money. I'm here to kind of, uh, run a business, but yeah. also to really kind of positively impact people's lives. Yeah. I, I, I looked in the mirror one day and I was like, look, what are we really excited about? I was like, I get excited at week six. When people people come back and they're really happy about their transformations, yeah. I just get fueled by that. And I, and then I like I I follow a few people on my patients on social media, and I see them out there enjoying living life, and they're so much happier, and they're um, or moms getting their body back, and mm-hmm. and um, I, I still have some breast reconstruction patients that are out there really enjoying their bodies as well. Um, that's that's what kind of really motivated me. What what what's kind of did this did this change your your mindset about what really matters in the end of the day and where you want to spend your time and your energy absolutely yeah you know i think at the end of the day you realize how short life really is and it yeah. really puts into perspective what is important and yeah you know, i do a lot more of the things that make me happy and surround myself with people who really make me happy and so, you know, I, I'd say it just make me a better person yeah. also, you know, and I think this was an amazing opportunity to be a support to other women. And- Has anybody reached out to you? Um that's going through this process. I know you've been very private about it and this is kind of, this is really special because it's kind (laughs) of one of those first times and that you've actually kind of opened up. I I didn't know very much about this at all. And, um, has anybody actually reached out to you about supportive, uh, support or or going through this or advice? Not, not really, but you know, I, the people that do know, I'm always willing to talk about it and to share my story. And, you know, certainly, um, in my family, you know, and, you know, encouraging cousins and, yeah, you know, to get tested, to or, get tested. Yeah. And I know after, you know, seeing what I went through and just, you know, just really with my girlfriends, you know, 
everyone here at work, just really encouraging everyone to to be proactive about their health. Yeah. And- so if, if you've had a family member, premenopausal breast cancer mm-hmm. um, and or a, uh, a male in your family got breast cancer, you should be screened. Um, and, uh, if you're just curious, you could definitely do a 23 and me test. <laughs> They're like a hundred bucks online. Um, that's not the most accurate one. So if you have the family yeah. indication, you need to go to a actual doctor and get yeah. the one that's fully detailed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the 23 and me one is kind of a nice one to, I'm negative on that one, but I don't have any family <laughs> history of breast cancer. So, you know, um, but, um, yeah, I think that's so important. I think educating, raising awareness, yes. one in eight women are going to get breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Catching it early, doing all the stuff, doing all the screening, all this stuff is going to save lives. Yeah. So what else? Well, and we're doing a great thing this month as well. That's right. So we're donating 5% of all of our surgeons' fees. And this was your idea, by the way. And I really love, I love getting involved with charities. And, um, but this one really hit home. I was like, look, we deal with breast surgery. We do breast surgery all the time. Um, You've had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, We've all been affected by somebody who had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And so um, we decided to donate five percent all the surgeons' fees for this month to yeah. um, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. So this is a this is a really good charity that donates uh, over ninety five percent of whatever it gets mm-hmm. to actual research, to curing, finding a cure, and finding um, uh, preventative uh, measures for breast cancer. So yeah. it's like big picture <laughs> stuff. And you found this charity. Tell us about this. Yeah. So bcrf dot yep. org. Okay. And. You know, I'm really excited that we were all able to support a great cause and, you know, really put awareness out there and and what better platform, you know, than with all of our patients. And on Absolutely. this podcast. Yeah. So if you are <laughs> thinking amazing. about booking your surgery, yeah. let's book it this month. 5% is going to go to the research foundation. Yeah. It's going to help somebody uh, in their research to really um, – to get this figured out, yeah. right? The screw cancer sucks. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's get it figured out and, and do something about it. Yeah. Um, not only that, but um, if you do, uh, if you are, if you are over 40, get your mammogram. If mm-hmm. you have a lump, get it checked out, go, go some, go see your doctor. And um, if you have a family member, immediate family member who's less than 50 that had uh, breast cancer, get screened mm-hmm. and, uh, or get tested. And then, uh, or if you had a male in the family with breast cancer, get, get your BRCA testing as well. Yeah. So great. All right. Alessandra, thank you so much for thank agreeing to being you. a great new member of the team and you've brought us already so far and thanks for sharing your story. <laughs>